My dad loved animals and he definitely passed that on to me. We spent a lot of time on my dad's boat too. You know, my dad was a very uh, avid sailor. Did you know that Errol Flynn is one of the most iconic sex symbols in Hollywood, known for his wild parties and larger than life person? But behind the glitz and glam, there were secrets he was trying to hide. Now his family has finally revealed the true cause of his death. What was the cause of his death? What other things was he hiding? And how did it all come to light? Stay tuned to find out. Early life, Errol Leslie Flynn was born on June 20th, 1909 in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. He was the only child of Theodore Thompson Flynn, a renowned biologist and professor, and Lily Mary Young, a descendant of Fletcher Christian of Bounty fame, who later changed her name to Morell. Errol's early years were marked by his adventurous spirit, a trait that would define much of his life and career. Flynn's childhood was spent in Tasmania, where he developed a love for the outdoors and nature, often engaging in activities such as sailing, swimming, and exploring the beautiful landscape of his surroundings. From a very young age, Flynn had a restless spirit and an unquenchable thirst for adventure that would shape his character both on and off the screen. Young Errol was always found spending his formative years with wild animals like tigers, kangaroos, opossums, and the local Tasmanian devils. These animals were cared for by his father, Theodore, who was a biology professor. His father's academic pursuits meant that the family moved frequently, and as a result, Flynn's education was somewhat erratic. He attended several schools, including Southwest London College and Sydney Church of England Grammar School, Shore School. Despite being raised in such a dream environment and being given everything he wanted, Flynn often found himself at odds with his mother, Morell, who he said would frequently resort to physical punishment during his childhood. This tumultuous relationship had a significant impact on young Flynn, contributing to his repeated expulsions and disciplinary actions. Errol Flynn first showed an interest in performing at the age of nine when he participated as a page boy for Australian politician Enid Lyons during a Queen Carnival. Unfortunately, these early efforts did not attract much notice or financial gain for him or his family. In 1923, Flynn was enrolled at Southwest London College, a private boarding school in Barnes, London. He remained there for two years before heading back to Australia in 1926 to join Sydney Church of England Grammar School, also known as Shore. During his time at Shore, he had the chance to meet John Gorton, who would later become the Prime Minister of Australia. However, Flynn's stint at Shore was cut short when he was expelled allegedly for theft. Flynn later disputed this, claiming that his expulsion was actually due to a scandal involving a school employee, though the specifics of the incident remain unclear. At the age of 14, Flynn was sent to Sydney to attend North Sydney Technical High School. However, his stay there was short-lived, and he soon found himself expelled once again. This period of his life was marked by a series of misadventures and brushes with the law, including accusations of theft and other misdemeanors. Despite these challenges, Flynn's charisma and charm began to emerge, qualities that would later endear him to audiences worldwide. Flynn's life began to spiral downward when he was once again accused of stealing petty cash in Sydney, leading to the loss of his job. As a result, in 1927, at the age of 18, Flynn decided to leave Australia and seek his fortune in Papua New Guinea. He initially worked on a tobacco plantation and later tried his hand at gold mining in the Morobe gold field. These years in Papua New Guinea were formative for Flynn as he faced numerous hardships and dangers, including tropical diseases, hostile environments, and financial difficulties. Nevertheless, his experiences during this time contributed to his development as a resilient and resourceful individual. Over the next five years, he managed to maintain some stability by alternating between New Guinea and Sydney, exploring various opportunities to achieve success. 
Flynn's time in Papua New Guinea also provided him with a wealth of stories and experiences that he would later draw upon in his acting career. His natural flair for storytelling and his larger-than-life persona began to take shape during these years, setting the stage for his eventual rise to fame in Hollywood. Errol Leslie Flynn's early life was characterized by adventure, rebellion, and a quest for independence. From his birth in Tasmania to his teenage years in Sydney and his daring exploits in Papua New Guinea, Flynn's formative years were anything but ordinary. These experiences laid the groundwork for his future success as one of Hollywood's most iconic and adventurous actors. Discovery and Early Career Errol Flynn's storied career in Hollywood began with an unexpected discovery. Born in 1909 in Hobart, Tasmania, Flynn's early years were characterized by a spirit of adventure that would later define his most famous roles. His discovery, however, took place on the remote island of New Guinea, where he had ventured in search of fortune through various enterprises, including tobacco farming and gold prospecting. While Flynn was working in Papua New Guinea, Australian filmmaker Charles Chauvel was creating a movie about the famous mutiny on the bounty called In the Wake of the Bounty. This film combined reenactments of the mutiny with real scenes from Pitcairn Island. Chauvel needed an actor to play Fletcher Christian, and there are various stories about how Flynn got the part. Some say Chauvel saw Flynn's picture in a story about a yacht wreck while the most popular account suggests Flynn was discovered by fellow cast member John Warwick. Although the film didn't perform well at the box office, Flynn depicted a spectacular performance that caught the audience's attention. Encouraged by the attention in the wake of the bounty brought him, Flynn capitalized on this newfound interest and headed to Britain later that year to pursue acting full-time. Journey to Hollywood. When he got to Britain, Flynn started off as an extra in a film called I Adore You. He then joined the Northampton Repertory Company for seven months to perfect his acting skills. Flynn appeared in various theaters across the UK, including the Malvern Festival and the famous London's West End. His time with the Northampton Repertory Company ended very shortly due to an incident involving a female stage manager. But that did not deter Flynn as he continued in the film industry till he finally landed a lead role in Murder at Monte Carlo in 1935. He was recommended by Irving Asher, who saw potential in him. Asher then was able to convince Warner Brothers in Hollywood to sign Flynn, leading him on a journey to Los Angeles. Flynn's big break came with the 1935 swashbuckling epic Captain Blood, directed by Michael Curtis. Originally, Robert Donat was cast in the title role, but his withdrawal opened the door for Flynn. The film's success turned Flynn into an overnight sensation, perfectly casting him as the quintessential swashbuckling hero. It showcased his athleticism, charisma, and undeniable screen presence, cementing his place in Hollywood. Rise to Fame At Warner Brothers, Flynn's big break came with Captain Blood, replacing the original choice for the lead role. The movie was a massive success, shooting Flynn and his co-star Olivia de Havilland to stardom. This success established him as one of Hollywood's leading men and led to more collaborations with de Havilland and director Michael Curtis, including The Charge of the Light Brigade. Flynn's versatility was evident as he tackled different roles in adventure films, dramas, and comedies. He starred in films like The Adventures of Robin Hood, which became a worldwide hit, showcasing Flynn's charisma and athleticism. Despite his on-screen charm and success, Flynn's adventurous spirit occasionally caused some friction with his co-stars. For instance, Bette Davis, his co-star in 1939's The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex, found his behavior unacceptable. She was particularly annoyed that Flynn received a higher salary than she did. In one memorable incident during a rehearsal in front of numerous other extras, Davis, who was wearing her elaborate Elizabethan rings, delivered a slap to Flynn that left a lasting impression on him. Years after the incident, Flynn compared it to a blow from boxing legend Joe Lewis himself. Embarrassed, 
Flynn confronted Davis in her dressing room, but Davis remained unfazed and told Flynn, if you can't take a little slap, that is just too bad. Career Highlights The late 1930s and early 1940s marked the peak of Errol Flynn's career. In addition to the aforementioned hits, he starred in The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex, 1939, alongside Bette Davis, which showcased his capability in more dramatic historical roles. This period also included collaborations with renowned directors and fellow actors, enriching his experience and expanding his repertoire. Flynn continued to garner acclaim and awards for his performances. He maintained a streak of back-to-back -back hit films with The Adventures of Robin Hood, standing out as one of his most renowned and commercially successful movies, challenges, and later career. Despite the challenges on set and his sometimes tense interactions with co-stars, Flynn's career was not without its challenges. As the 1940s progressed, his popularity began to wane due to changing public tastes and his own personal struggles, including well-documented issues with alcohol and legal controversies. These factors inevitably affected his career trajectory and box office draw. Attempting to revitalize his image and career, Flynn took on more diverse roles in the late 1940s and 1950s, ranging from westerns like Montana, 1950, to the war drama Objective, Burma, 1945. During this time, World War II was gaining momentum, but Flynn's acting career continued to thrive as he starred in films such as Gentleman Jim, 1942, and Desperate Journey, 1942. However, amidst these successes, Flynn's personal life faced serious scandals, including inappropriate touching charges that tarnished his public image. Despite these challenges, Flynn remained a popular and influential figure in Hollywood, consistently delivering memorable performances from one movie set to another. His enduring passion for the craft and willingness to evolve as an actor kept him in the public eye, even as he faced numerous personal and professional obstacles. Personal Life Errol Flynn's personal life was as dramatic and tumultuous as his on-screen adventures. Known for his charming and roguish persona, Flynn's off-screen escapades became legendary, earning him a reputation as one of Hollywood's most notorious womanizers. Flynn was a man who truly embraced the high life. He became infamous for his womanizing, heavy drinking, chain smoking, and drug use. During the 1940s, Flynn's romantic escapades included well-known figures like Lupe Velez, Marlene Dietrich, and Dolores Del Rio. However, some, like Carol Lombard, managed to resist his charms, though she still invited him to her grand parties. Flynn was a frequent guest at Hearst Castle's lavish events until he was expelled one night for being too drunk. Flynn's charm was so legendary that the phrase, in like Flynn, was coined to describe his effortless ability to win over women, though the exact origin of the phrase is still debated. Flynn was so fond of the saying that he wanted to title his memoir, In Like Me, but his publisher insisted on the more provocative title, My Wicked Wicked Ways. According to sources, Flynn's mansion was full of secret passages and peepholes, including a trapdoor above a guest room for covert viewing. When Rolling Stones guitarist Ronnie Wood toured the place, he found Flynn's mirrors and hidden speaker systems, which were not for security, but for Flynn's personal amusement. Hollywood gossip magazines of the time often featured scandalous stories about his elaborate peeping tactics. Flynn was married three times and had four children. His first marriage was to actress Lily DeMita in 1935. The union was stormy and filled with public disputes, eventually ending in divorce in 1942. They had one child together, Sean Flynn, who later became a photojournalist and tragically disappeared in Cambodia in 1970 while covering the Vietnam War. Flynn's second marriage was to Nora Eddington in 1943. Eddington was working as a clerk at a courthouse where Flynn was on trial for inappropriate touching, a charge for which he was acquitted. They had two daughters, Deirdre and Rory, but their marriage also ended in divorce in 1949. In 1950, 
Flynn married actress Patrice Wymore, and they had one daughter, Arnella Flynn. This marriage lasted until Flynn's death, although it was also marked by separations and infidelities. Arnella struggled with substance abuse and died young in 1998. Flynn also had a loyal canine companion named Arno, specially trained to protect him. Arno was by Flynn's side everywhere he went until the dog's unfortunate death in 1941. Flynn's womanizing was well documented and often scandalous. He was known for his numerous affairs with actresses and socialites, earning him the infamous phrase, In Like Flynn. His autobiography, My Wicked Wicked Ways, published posthumously in 1959, detailed many of his romantic exploits and provided a candid look into his hedonistic lifestyle. Beyond his relationships, Flynn's personal lifestyle was characterized by excess and indulgence. He was known for love for adventure extended beyond the screen, as he was an avid sailor and owned several yachts. His travels and exploits on the high seas were as much a part of his legend as his film roles. Flynn's legal troubles also played a significant role in his personal life. The unlawful minor relationship trial in 1942 was a major scandal, though he was acquitted of the charges. Despite this, the trial took a toll on his reputation and career. Flynn's financial troubles were another constant issue, exacerbated by his extravagant spending and poor investments. In his later years, Flynn's health deteriorated rapidly due to his hard living lifestyle. He suffered from various ailments, including liver disease and heart problems. Despite his declining health, Flynn continued to work, appearing in films and television shows until his death. The Sex Symbol Errol Flynn's image as a sex symbol was something he both cultivated and embraced with gusto. He openly referred to himself as a phallic symbol, a boldly provocative statement that epitomized his excessive and flamboyant lifestyle. Notoriously candid about his affairs, Flynn often bragged about his cocaine-fueled sexual exploits, which became legendary in Hollywood. However, this lifestyle came with serious repercussions. In 1943, Flynn's behavior caught up with him when he faced charges of inappropriate touching involving two underage girls. While he admitted to a consensual encounter with one of them, he claimed to barely know the other. The trial turned into a media circus, turning Flynn into both a national laughingstock and an even more potent sex symbol. The spectacle of the trial only added fuel to his already fiery image. During this turbulent period, Flynn encountered 18-year-old Nora Eddington, who would soon become his second wife. The couple went on to have two daughters. Though Flynn was acquitted of all charges, the damage to his reputation was considerable, casting a long shadow over his career. Off-screen escapades and wild parties. Flynn's off-screen life was as adventurous as his on-screen roles. His home on Mulholland Drive in the Hollywood Hills was infamous for its wild parties. The house served as a perennial party spot, overflowing with celebrities, friends, and even complete strangers. The gatherings were often so grandiose that Flynn sometimes found it difficult to move through his own home due to the sheer number of guests. In his autobiography, Flynn vividly recounted the eclectic mix of people who frequented his parties, including actors, athletes, criminals, and salesmen. He humorously depicted himself as irresistibly attractive to women, often joking that he needed a baseball bat to fend them off. Women were known to show up at his residence daily, proposing marriage despite his widely publicized infidelities. Flynn frequently defended himself against accusations of infidelity, asserting that he was merely responding to the advances of women. He famously quipped, If I'm sitting in my dressing room and a pretty girl comes in and pulls my zipper down, I'm not doing anything wrong. I didn't touch her. This nonchalant attitude towards his romantic encounters gave rise to the famous phrase, In Like Flynn, which connoted quick success, particularly in romantic conquests. 
In his candid autobiography, My Wicked Wicked Ways, he suggested that the women's pursuits were both frequent and voluntary, irrespective of whether he reciprocated their advances. Flynn was known for carrying a distinct suitcase labeled Flynn Enterprises, which was filled with vodka, glasses, quinine, and a Bible. As his lifestyle grew more reckless and chaotic, his alcohol consumption escalated. The toll of his hard living ways was evident. His once handsome face became bloated and pale, a stark reminder of his self-destructive tendencies. His parties were the stuff of Hollywood legend. Guests were treated to extravagant feasts, unlimited liquor, and often debauchery that stretched into the early hours. Flynn's charm and charisma drew people from all walks of life into his orbit, each party a testament to his magnetic personality. His home was a revolving door of merrymaking where boundaries were often blurred and societal norms were regularly flouted. Stories of Flynn's wild parties circulated throughout Hollywood, contributing to both his notoriety and his allure. Women adored him and men wanted to be him. It was not uncommon for Flynn to engage in casual flings even during these parties, further cementing his image as a libertine. Despite facing occasional backlash for his behavior, Flynn demonstrated an unfaltering commitment to living life on his own terms. His indulgences defined him as much as his cinematic heartthrob persona. Through it all, he managed to maintain a public image that was equal parts scandalous and charming. The Mulholland Drive Parties The parties held at Flynn's Mulholland Drive residence grew into legendary events that became part of Hollywood folklore. Equipped with an endless supply of alcohol and drugs, these gatherings saw some of Hollywood's biggest stars letting loose. Flynn's home became synonymous with a carefree, almost reckless approach to socializing that only intensified his image as a libertine sex symbol. The constant stream of guests ranged from top-tier actors to notorious criminals, each adding to the chaotic ambiance. The house was a luxurious playground where societal norms were optional and hedonistic pleasure was the rule of the day. Flynn's description of these parties often included humorous anecdotes about his irresistible allure to women, citing their unabashed proposals and advances. Infamous Encounters Among Flynn's many escapades were stories of women who showed up at his home, undeterred by his reputation. Flynn humorously noted that he had to be on guard at all times, treating his own home as if it were a public space where everyone wanted a piece of him. This constant attention and the ease with which he could attract women led to the creation of his famous phrase, In Like Flynn, which succinctly captured his swift and frequent romantic successes. Life on the Zaka. Flynn's exploits were not confined to his home. His yacht, the Zaka, also became a floating haven for his hedonistic lifestyle. Days on the yacht were filled with sunbathing, diving, and unrestrained partying. The yacht was as much a symbol of his opulent lifestyle as his Hollywood mansion, and it provided a private, mobile venue for his notorious gatherings. By the 1950s, the scene shifted from his Hollywood Hills home to his yacht, the Zaka, further embedding his legend into the fabric of Hollywood's wild stories. The maritime setting offered a new venue for Flynn's infamous parties, now set against the Mediterranean backdrop. Life on the Zaka continued the tradition of exuberant gatherings, featuring an array of distinguished guests, from movie stars like Rita Hayworth to royalty such as King Farouk of Egypt. Flynn's third wife, Patrice Weimer, and their daughter often accompanied him, witnessing firsthand the grandiosity of his lifestyle. Despite being at sea, the yacht parties mirrored those in Hollywood with extravagance and an anything-goes philosophy, involving endless swimming, diving, and, of course, uninhibited merrymaking. Reckless Lifestyle and Consequences Flynn's partying lifestyle came with its share of consequences. Financial difficulties began to mount as he consistently lived beyond his means. 
His notorious love for spending lavishly and blaming others for his monetary woes only added to his troubled financial state. Moreover, the physical toll of his reckless indulgence became apparent as he aged. His dependency on alcohol deepened, and he was rarely seen without his signature suitcase labeled Flynn Enterprises, packed with vodka and other essentials. The toll of his lifestyle choices manifested physically. His once chiseled and handsome visage turned bloated and unhealthily pale, clear signs of his relentless partying and heavy drinking. Flynn's deteriorating health mirrored the decline of old Hollywood's golden age, both coming to terms with the limits of endless excess. Association with the Nazis In 1980, writer Charles Hyam stirred up controversy by suggesting that Errol Flynn might have been a Nazi spy. Hyam's theory hinged on Flynn's associations with several individuals who had connections to the Nazi party. One of Flynn's close friends was Dr. Herman Urban, a known Nazi party member who claimed he was solicited to act as a spy, although he never confirmed that he actually took on this role. Another associate, Freddie McEvoy, was reputed to be anti-Semitic and a Nazi sympathizer. Additionally, Hyam recounted a story from an unnamed source who claimed that her husband, who was close to Flynn, had overheard Flynn drunkenly admitting to being a Nazi spy. This assertion, however, quickly degenerated into a messy he said, she said scenario. Critics of Hyam's theory point to the lack of conclusive evidence. In 1990, the book Errol Flynn, The Spy Who Never Was argued against Hyam's claims, maintaining that there was insufficient proof to substantiate that Flynn was involved in espionage for the Nazis. While Flynn's associations raised eyebrows, the theory that he was a Nazi spy remained speculative and widely disputed. Trials and legal drama. Errol Flynn's faced significant legal troubles in 1942 when he was accused of inappropriate touching two underage girls, Betty Hansen and Peggy Satterley. The allegations triggered a media circus, but Flynn's fans, particularly women, remained resolutely loyal. However, the strain from these accusations drove Flynn deeper into alcoholism, which profoundly impacted his film career. His movies began to suffer at the box office, critics became harsher, and financial woes ensued. Despite warnings to directors about his drinking problems, Flynn managed to eye-push through during shoots and eventually turned to harder substances, rendering him increasingly difficult to work with. Warner Brothers, exasperated, eventually terminated his contract. The inappropriate touching trial itself was a sensational spectacle that captivated the nation. Flynn faced three serious charges, which could have resulted in a prison sentence of up to 50 years. Despite the gravity of these accusations, Flynn's popularity did not wane. Instead, his fans gathered in droves outside the courtroom, with many securing seats inside to watch the proceedings. The courtroom was so charged with emotion that doctors were on standby to assist feigning fans. The trial commenced on January 11, 1943, forcing the young accusers to testify without anonymity, which added to their stress. Meanwhile, Flynn's undeniable charm worked in his favor within the courtroom. Female fans swarmed outside the courthouse, requesting autographs and even snapping up pieces of his clothing as souvenirs. Flynn received a steady stream of supportive letters, primarily from female admirers, and his studio fast-tracked the release of his next film to exploit the heightened public interest. The jury consisted of nine women and three men. Flynn adeptly charmed them, often smiling and directly engaging with jurors throughout the trial. His defense team worked meticulously to discredit the accusers, portraying them as unreliable and untrustworthy due to their working-class backgrounds and limited education. The defense argued that the accusations were fabricated as part of a financial extortion scheme. The case relied heavily on conflicting testimonies. Flynn, taking the stand in his defense, vehemently denied all the allegations. Even under intense cross-examination, he maintained his innocence, 
The prosecution urged the jury to look beyond Flynn's charisma, while Flynn's attorney painted a picture of the actor as a victim, insisting that the accusers were deceitful. Ultimately, the jury delivered a not guilty verdict, a decision that led to widespread celebration among Flynn's supporters outside the courthouse. Flynn expressed his heartfelt gratitude to each juror, reinforcing his enduring appeal despite the scandal. The trial underscored the complex power dynamics and societal attitudes toward women in 1940s Hollywood. Decades later, movements like Nars Me Too would revisit similar themes, highlighting the ongoing exploitation and mistreatment of young women in the entertainment industry. Continued Legal Struggles Flynn's brush with the law didn't end with the inappropriate touching trial. His tumultuous lifestyle, marked by relentless partying and substance abuse, often landed him in further legal hot water. Flynn faced multiple lawsuits, including breaches of contract and defamation cases, which added to his already beleaguered public image. One notable case involved allegations of assault and battery, stemming from a brawl at a nightclub. According to witnesses, Flynn had been heavily intoxicated during the altercation, which only compounded the negative perceptions of his off-screen behavior. Although he often managed to escape severe punitive measures thanks to his team's legal maneuvering and his adept charm, these legal battles weighed heavily on Flynn's career and finances. Legal Repercussions and Decline Flynn's incessant partying and run-ins with the law steadily eroded his once untouchable status. Each lawsuit, each headline depicting his debauchery, chipped away at his credibility and employability in Hollywood. For instance, a high-profile defamation case saw Flynn embroiled in a bitter legal battle after a rival actor accused him of making slanderous remarks. This and other legal dramas significantly drained his finances and tarnished his name. Warner Brothers' decision to sever ties with Flynn was a pivotal moment. The studio, weary of his unpredictable behavior and mounting controversies, found it increasingly difficult to justify maintaining his contract. Losing the steady income and industry clout that came with being one of their top stars marked the beginning of a professional decline from which Flynn could never fully recover. Persistent alcoholism and drug addiction. Flynn's battles with alcohol and drugs were widely known and often exacerbated during filming sessions and public appearances. During the height of his trials, his consumption of alcohol, along with his use of narcotics and other recreational drugs, surged. Despite attempts by colleagues and friends to intervene, Flynn's dependencies deepened, adversely affecting his health and work ethic. By the early 1950s, Flynn's condition had visibly deteriorated. His once lustrous good looks became pallid and bloated, a stark reminder of his self-destructive habits. This transformation was not merely physical. His erratic behavior and diminished capacity for work led to strained relationships with producers and directors alike. Public Redemption and Final Years Even in the twilight of his career, Flynn made occasional efforts to reclaim his former glory. He appeared in several films and television shows, although none imagined the success of his earlier work. Despite these attempts, the combined impact of ongoing legal issues financial instability, and his deteriorating health prevented any significant resurgence. In his later years, Flynn's association with the Nazis and his notorious personal life continued to be subjects of media speculation and public interest. While the Nazi espionage accusations remained largely unsubstantiated, the complex narrative of his life as a charismatic actor dogged by personal scandals and legal battles ensured that Flynn would forever be a figure of intrigue and controversy. Death. In 1959, Errol Flynn faced significant financial difficulties. To address these issues, he traveled to Vancouver on October 9th to discuss leasing his yacht, Zaka, to businessman George Caldog. Flynn was accompanied by Beverly Adland, a 17-year-old actress who was later revealed to be his girlfriend. 
Flynn was in his 50s at the time. On October 14th, while Caldo was driving Flynn and Adlin to the airport for their return to Los Angeles, Flynn began experiencing severe pain in his back and legs. Concerned, Caldo diverted to Dr. Grant Gould's residence. Flynn had difficulty climbing stairs, prompting Dr. Gould to suspect degenerative disc disease and spinal osteoarthritis, both known to cause intense pain. To relieve Flynn's pain, Dr. Gould administered a 50 milliliter intravenous injection of Demerol, a pain medication. Flynn's pain eased, and he began reflecting on his life. Feeling better, he even declined a drink when offered. Dr. Gould advised Flynn to rest in the apartment's bedroom before continuing his journey. Flynn assured everyone that he felt much better. However, 20 minutes later, Adlin found Flynn unresponsive. Despite immediate medical intervention and a quick transfer to Vancouver General Hospital, Flynn never regained consciousness and was pronounced dead that evening. The coroner's report stated that he died of a myocardial infarction, commonly known as a heart attack, caused by coronary thrombosis and coronary atherosclerosis. Additionally, Flynn had liver issues, including fatty degeneration and partial cirrhosis, which contributed to his death. Flynn was buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Glendale, California, a place he had previously expressed a dislike for. What Flynn's family had to say. Almost 50 years after Errol Flynn's passing, his final spouse, Patrice Wymore, shed light on his decline. Wymore's own career began on Broadway in the 1940s, where she featured in musicals before moving to Hollywood. Her Hollywood debut came in 1950 with the romantic comedy Tea for Two, starring alongside Doris Day and Gordon McRae. In the same year, she also appeared in the western Rocky Mountain, which reportedly led to her meeting Flynn. Following the completion of the film, Flynn broke off his engagement to a Romanian princess to wed Wymore. In his 1959 autobiography, My Wicked Wicked Ways, Flynn described how he nonchalantly had his housekeeper inform the princess over the phone, showing little concern for ending ties with royalty. Despite his expressed wish for a stable marriage, Flynn continued with his notorious behavior, including infidelity, heavy drinking, and drug use. He also endured career setbacks and significant financial losses, particularly from his unsuccessful efforts to produce a film adaptation of William Tell. At the time of his death in 1959, Flynn and Wymore were separated while he was in Canada, living with his teenage girlfriend, Beverly Adland. Nonetheless, Wymore chose not to remarry and consistently defended Flynn in interviews, claiming that the scandalous public image of Flynn did not match the man she knew. In an interview from 2005, she commented, he simply lost his way. Errol Flynn's once illustrious career was ultimately overshadowed by numerous challenges that led to his downfall. Despite his daring on-screen roles, Flynn faced substantial personal and professional issues. While his legacy as an actor endures, it is inextricably linked with the tumultuous and often scandalous chapters of his personal life. Flynn's tale serves as a cautionary narrative about the complexities and pitfalls of fame and the relentless scrutiny endured by those who, like Flynn, live life on the grandest and most contentious of stages.